Hello, my name is Nathan Wells, and I'm going to present to you today a project that I did for a University of Wisconsin master's thesis, which part of it involved finding the fish passage from Lake Mendota into the Cherokee freshwater estuary using a side scan sonar. I was able to do this research in cooperation with Dane County, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the University of Wisconsin Center for Limnology, and then the department that I was in, the environmental fluid mechanics, and water resource engineering. The Cherokee Freshwater Estuary is located north of Lake Mendota, and it's had some issues in the past, which include substantial erosion and shoreline vegetation loss. You can see the increase in surface water area over just 30 years in the estuary. 42 years later, you can see that the peat bogs have nearly all washed away, and the surface water area has increased substantially. Over this same time period, you can see a general decrease in emergent vegetation. One of the main drivers of this is the water level increase from the Tenny Locks that dammed the water up and raised the Lake Mendota water levels about seven feet over this same time period. There's also an increase in turbidity levels from water runoff from nearby farm fields. A high carp population probably contributes to the high turbidity levels as well. And they're also a problem for populations of game fish in the estuary. From a previous part of my project, we knew that radio tag carp did not leave the Cherokee Lake and estuary system. So we wanted to find out whether or not fish from Lake Mendota entered Cherokee Lake or vice versa. Fish left Cherokee Lake and went into Lake Mendota. We wanted to find out how many fish and what times of year they moved most often. The last time any sort of survey was performed was over 50 years ago and it was only for a period of about a month. They used fike nets to capture fish moving in both directions and while they were able to identify fish species very easily it was a very labor-intensive and highly costly process. We wanted to create a system that was inexpensive and could be deployed for long term. It needed limited maintenance and the equipment needed to be secure on the site. One of the most important things was that it couldn't impede vessel navigation between the water bodies and that it had to be deployed and able to be removed quickly. Our solution was to develop an acoustic image monitoring system using a side scan sonar and a gimbal system that I designed and fabricated. The gimbal system allows the side scan sonar to be deployed to the bottom of the water body. And since it has two axes of rotation, the gimbal allows the side scan sonar to always be facing the water surface. We decided to deploy the system underneath the railroad bridge and use the power from a nearby restaurant. Using solar panels wasn't an option because the area was heavily fished and we were fearful of vandalism. The side scan covered approximately 64% of the cross-sectional area underneath the bridge. The Humminbird side scan sonar also included a 20 degree and 60 degree cone directly above the side scan sonar. Generally in most side scan sonars this is dead space, but with this one the two conical sections and the side scan slivers are stitched together in the recordings that you see. Like any sonar, side imaging relies on sound waves to locate and record fish. The echo sounder produces a ping which travels through the water as a compression wave and bounces off any interface of two differing densities. On a fish, this is generally the air bladder. So I took the system and deployed it to the bottom underneath the railroad bridge. It didn't take very long before the transducer cable became severed. So I had to don my scuba gear and run the transducer cable through a PVC pipe. Even though the water depth was less than six feet, once I got to about four feet, I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face because the turbidity levels were so high. So that was kind of challenging, but I was able to finish the task and begin recording. We then used a DVR to record the data coming off the Humminbird sonar. So the video that you're seeing right now is of the side scan sonar looking towards the water surface. The areas to the far left and the far right are the side imaging, and the area in the center is directly above the side scan sonar. So just to the left and just to the right are the conical sections that I told you about earlier. So the white streaks going down would be what I consider fish signatures and depending on the size and the velocity of the fish would depend on the intensity and the length of the signature. So to ensure that that's indeed what a fish signature looks like 
We took a, an 18 inch carp and tethered it by the mouth and tail and gently pulled it across the side scan sonar a number of times in a number of different orientations at a, a number of different speeds and depths. Along with the fish signatures, we got a lot of noise. And so what we had to do is some image processing. Since every 10 seconds of the video is new information, we divided the video into 10 second images. We then added all of the 10 second images values, pixel values together, and then divided by the number of 10 second images there were to find a background image mean. We then took the background image mean and subtracted it from the original images to reduce the majority of the noise. We pulled the carp over the side scan sonar a total of 35 times and I could visibly identify them from the video recorded by the DVR approximately 25 times. Since the turbidity was high, there was no exact way of knowing the orientation of the carp as it passed the sonar. Then the next thing we did was take those images, find the overall mean of that image, and subtract it from itself to get an image that has more contrast. The next step of the image processing procedure was to eliminate reflective sonar echoes that were not fish signatures. An experimental minimum pixel value was found, and all pixels that met or exceeded this value were converted to ones, while all other pixels in the image were converted to zeros. All these binary images were vertically concatenated together, and then a minimum and maximum area of connected pixels was chosen to limit very small signals and very large signals from being counted as fish. So from July 2012 to the middle of June 2013, about 156,000 fish were counted over 269 days of active recordings. The largest count in the fall was around 2,500 signals, and in the spring there was a one day where there were 3,800 signals. The largest average fish per day counts were in the spring, slowly dwindled to August and then started increasing again in the fall. And because of power loss or technical difficulties, the months in red only had the, the amount of days of data shown in the table above. To determine the period of day with the most movement, I created a histogram with 24 bins representing each hour of each day. And you can see from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock was the time of day with the most fish signatures and then it slowly dwindled till around four o'clock in the afternoon and then started rising again as the evening came. The study area is known to have a substantial population of catfish and which is a species most active at night and so that it's possible they represent much of the nighttime movement. And You can see this same diurnal pattern uh, found in July over a two-week period where the peak is shortly after midnight. The diurnal movement during the fall is not as smooth and less predictable as July, but still evident. It seems that the largest factor in whether or not the fish are moving is the water temperature. You can see that as the water temperature drops below 5 degrees Celsius, the fish movement nearly ceases. And then, later on in the spring, the water temperature rises above 5 degrees and the fish start moving again. Now, walleye and northern pike generally spawn at temperatures around 4 degrees Celsius. So it is possible that the, the, the fish movement that you're seeing in the springtime is northern pike and walleye. So hourly fish flux can be determined, and it appears that movement slows when water temperatures reach 5 degrees. Further studies should be made to apportion species, because I can't identify what species they are, and I'm not able to determine the direction of movement, unfortunately. It also may be helpful to have a more robust counting algorithm, since errors of commission and errors of omission were made during the survey. Well, thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed my talk. And considering I spent probably around $2,000 on the entire project, I would consider it quite successful. If you'd like more information on this project, you can go to the following website and read the thesis. And along with this project, I also determined the individual and seasonal carp movement throughout the Cherokee estuary over a two-year period. I monitored the fish flux, which I just did the presentation on. And then I found the impact percentages of hydrologic, hydrodynamic, and biological factors on turbidity caused by sediment resuspension in the Cherokee estuary.